Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Crime Centric. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are crime dramas. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the series premiere of Death and Other Details. A great series premiere. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. Well, first and foremost, I wasn't aware that this story was going to be what it is. I, I have not seen the trailer. I, I was aware of this show, but I never watched the trailer because it came out after, after the fact. But... The fact is that I knew this was a locked room murder, but I wasn't expecting the circumstances to be what they are. Us getting introduced to Rufus, specifically uh, how it starts off with an investigation from 18 years ago. He's looking at Imogen. is this little girl whose mom died, he brutally merged. He was killed in a car bombing. Um, and Rufus is one of the world's greatest detectives, even labeled the world's greatest detective. I don't think he'd ever label himself that. I think he even told that Imogen, like, yeah, that's kind of the name other people give me. I don't really resort to that. I'm just like, hey, I do the job. That's, that's there. And so he is investigating her mom's murder, and we kind of skip to 18 years later, and we find out that's who Violet Bean is playing, which I, I, I always kept seeing the name Violet Bean. I'm like, it seemed, and when I looked at her, I was like, she looks so familiar, but what do I know her from? The thing I know her from is the Flash TV show. She was uh, Jesse Quick. So I was like, oh man, that's crazy. Uh, but yeah, uh, she plays the older version of Imogen, and she does not have the greatest uh, perspective on Rufus because he's the one that abandoned her. Like when she felt like she had no one else in her corner, she was 10 years old, just lost her mom. We don't know what the dad situation is. Maybe. Who knows, like, maybe her dad walked out of her life, maybe her dad died when she was young, who knows. Obviously, it's focused on her mom. Her mom is the only person she had, and she was kind of left alone in this world. Granted, she was she was taken in by the Collier family, because, like, her and, and I guess that's also why, like, they would seem like, they were pretty close to her mom. I don't know whether, like, they just worked with her mom or whatever the relationship was, but Trip and Anna are, like, Anna's her her friend, kind of like her best friend. They're kind of pseudo sisters, but they they don't refer to each other as siblings. They do treat each other more like friends. So she was never properly adopted by the Collier family, but she's treated like family. But the relationship between her and Anna, it feels like there is meant to be this distinction of we're not siblings. We don't treat each other like siblings. Maybe Anna looks at her like one, but it feels like. Imogen knows, like, no, I know what time it is. Your family has been good to me, but I, I recognize we are two different groups. I'm not part of the rich and powerful. You are. This is your family. I'm kind of a guest in this family. Not even as a sister. I am your friend. It feels like Imogen tries to delineate that as she kind of gets into that argument with Keith about it, where he tries to call her out. It's like, right, you're trying to fight the system from the inside, but it doesn't make you like an insider. It just makes you a hypocrite. Because you get to kind of benefit from all of this and you, you're trying to act like you're better than them, but it kind of makes you worse than them. Because at least they are who they are and they don't try to pretend to be otherwise. You're connected to this family, yet you're trying to pretend like you're not, you know, benefiting from like having these rich people connected to you. So um, I wasn't expecting that to kind of be where we started off. And, I, you know, in, in, in media res opening of, okay, we start off with like, obviously Imogen's got beef. With Keith because he's a prick. He treated one of the uh, staff like shit. Uh, because it's like, he's not even like someone that's necessarily rich and powerful, but he was kind of brought aboard because he's tr one of Tripp's business partners or is he's trying to make a deal with. So he kind of acts all hoity toity and stuff. Because you saw him earlier, like, as we, when we rewound, we saw him kind of sucking up to uh, Papa and Mama uh, Collier. So it like kind of shows you who he is. Um, but yeah, Imogen. Took his key card, uh, basically broke into his room while he was passed out on a bed, smashed his watch, and then kind of like stole some money from him. But then she looks up and notices the camera. She seemed like she was kind of smiling towards it. So I guess she was thinking like, right, I'm connected to this family. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. It does. It did seem like someone was watching the footage. So I don't. I didn't know like, did she get in contact with someone? to like handle that for her but then the next morning the staff comes in and they find Keith the murder and we kind of rewind the circumstances to find out everything okay so the Collier families on this boat trip is not only a vacation it's a massive business deal they're trying to make a business deal with this other family the Chuns they're like a, a fashion mogul family um, and they're trying to make a deal with them and so 
it's a it's a deal that Anna needs to go through because this is going to be the, the sink or swim of it all because if she doesn't make this deal work, it screws her chances of taking over because she's supposed to be replacing her father, but her father's like, no, nah, I'm not handing over the kings of the cast, keys to the castle. Makes a lot of sense. You don't become rich and powerful and stay that way by handing it to your kids because you're like, nah, I can still run things. I feel like there probably is an ulterior motive there that he might be, hey, the family situation might not be as good as I make it seem to be, so I don't want to pass it to my daughter yet because either he's like, hey, she's not ready, she hasn't proven herself, or I just don't want to let go of this because I have a hard time letting go, or it could be a situation of, because she's the youngest, because it should go to Trip, but Trip is kind of the fuck up of the family. He's got a whole bunch of businesses, but none of them have panned out, so he's kind of the screw up of the family. But it might still be a thing of the that dad might be on some like, yeah, I'm not going to give it to Anna because I need Trip to get his shit together because it needs to pass to him. Like, not unless they're going to make it so that Trip is the fall guy. Like, like I said, the business my, family stuff might not be what uh, Papa. It, it's Lawrence. I, I couldn't remember dad's name, but like Lawrence probably doesn't want to admit things are as bad and maybe he's setting Trip up to be the fall guy or maybe he's hoping he can gain everything in control before passing it on to Anna but just the harder he tries the more everything's slipping through his fingertips so maybe that's also why this deal needs to go through hell maybe Anna's aware of the family the circumstances of why this is going the way it is and maybe because Tripp specifically says she needs this deal to work out it has to but I like I said I attributed that to being like if she doesn't do this it's going to like her dad already won't pass the torch to her but she definitely won't get the torch passed if she screws up this deal so that's going to be the interesting thing to see like is this more so for Anna's sake or is this deal more so for Lawrence's sake I mean either way it's you know Anna making the deal for her dad's sake so it can ultimately be for her own sake so that she can take over the family business and such so it's going to be interesting to see where they kind of like how that all falls out over the course of everything we also get introduced to kind of the head of the staff Teddy uh, which we end up finding out quite a bit of the staff are people that are related to her she has her sisters up here as well as we find at least one of the other staff members is her um the one of the cleaning ladies is her um aunt so i wonder is that specifically her mom's sister i wonder is it a situation of like she ends up employing a lot of her family because well you want to keep people you can trust and who can you trust better than family which it's not always an easy thing. Family ends up being the people you can't trust the most, which I think that's going to be an interesting dichotomy because uh, a group of rich people, some of them being family, the rich are easy to stab each other in the back. Those who are actual family and those who are treated like family, which, you know, Imogen's in that category, but so is the lawyer. There's also that guy who's like a priest or whatever. He's like father or something. That guy, he's kind of also associated with the Colliers as well, so... I think that's going to be an interesting dichotomy with someone who's actually working with their, their family and giving them opportunities because she's given this opportunity and she wants to make sure the rest of her family is okay. I mean, I think it might also stem from like a, it's it's also an Asian, you know, cultural thing. Like I, there's a, a lot of cultures that do it, but it's, it's especially true in Asian culture of taking care of the family, being responsible for your family, like always, especially the elders, because she's already having to take responsibility for her sister, but her sister threw it in her face being like, you can't fire me because then mom's going to jump down your case, so, but also having your aunt on board, it feels like, right, you're kind of responsible for taking care of your entire family, and this job means a lot, because she was even trying to make it clear to her sister too, just because you're around these people, you might start thinking like, oh, you could be around them, you're like them, but it's like, no, they have protection that you don't. The thing that will always keep them safe, and her sister's like, like I said, I'm assuming it's her sister because she said mom, so mom will be mad at you, so it's like, either either they're, I'd assume they're siblings, but maybe it is like a, oh, they're cousins. It, it could easily be that type of thing too, but... It's like they have a protection that you never will, and that's money. They have an ungodly amount of money, which gives them a lot of protection and influence to get away with literal murder, you know, and I think that's going to be kind of the whole rub of it all. Um, we have Imogen meeting uh, uh, Sunil, who is played by my boy, Raul Coley. I was so excited. I did not know he was in this show until I was I came across the cast. I was like, Rob who's on this? Like, oh, that's so awesome. He's just one of those actors where it's like I've seen him like, you know, just 
personality wise and stuff like that outside of acting and stuff and i just i've, I've been very endeared to him like ever since i he started popping up in like funhouse videos years ago because obviously he's pretty tight with funhouse but it's just like and just seeing you know obviously like hearing his story you know about like prior like his you know his career prior to i zombie and just ever since like i zombie the direction his career is going it's just like oh no he's just one of those actors you're like i'm so happy to see to direct the trajectory his career has taken you know and, and to, you know just the, the 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 good work he's been putting out there you know uh, continuously, so th that's why I'm just like I'm very. I have a uh, Ronald Coley will always have a, like a soft spot in my heart type of situation. But either way, um, turns out he's playing Sunil, who's the guy who made the boat. He immediately kind of latches on to, um, latches on to Imogen, which I thought was kind of interesting. I'm curious to see what ends up becoming of that because. Well, he's already kind of put in another situation where, like, there's a daughter related to the Chun family that he has to get close to. It's like, but he also, he's like, yeah, but she is someone that is more interested in someone of the fairer sex. So I think, you know, implying, like, she's in the women, but it's kind of like, yeah, but she has to parade around for appearances sake. Like, there's a guy, so someone powerful like you making your own boat, like, for appearances sake you because also her family has deep deep pockets and it will benefit you um i don't know if he's run out of money or not because he sunk a lot of his money into the ship because him and imogen have this really great conversation later on about purpose he's getting over a breakup uh he's like yeah uh she would she preferred me as a banker I initially didn't know how to interpret that, whether it's like a, oh, no, I was literally a banker or whether he meant that in a metaphorical sense of, oh, she kind of only liked me for my money. But he was also like, yeah, I was angry and I wasn't a lot of fun. So it just didn't work out. And uh, but for him, he's like the boat and everything like it isn't about is he happy now? You know, that's, I'm sure, debatable, but, you know, for him, it's like he found purpose. And with this, he can leave his mark in the world, which Imogen had that conversation earlier, too. Like, I do apologize. I'm jumping all over the place, but it's just, there's just, there is a lot. Because this is the setup episode, so you're getting drunk in by, like, okay, give you the widespread shotgun shot of, like, okay, this is this character. This is who they are. This is how they're connected, so on and so forth. Um, so we're just kind of getting spring loaded in the middle of this. So you got a lot of information dumped on you in the first episode type of situation. So it's a lot of setup. Uh, what I thought was interesting, obviously Imogen recognizes Rufus immediately. Cause I've obviously like you spent probably the past 18 years hating the guy's guts because you felt like he abandoned you when you needed him most. And so Imogen avoids him at first, lets Anna know what's what her family. She lets her family know that kind of turns into an interesting conversation because they're like, right, we have our history with Rufus and we hate Rufus. So did the Chuns hire Rufus specifically just to kind of mess with our heads? And it's like, was that a tactical move? Because Anna's suggesting like, maybe they don't trust us. Maybe that's kind of meant to be a middle finger to us, bring him aboard. But everyone else is like, yeah, but he's a hack. He's basically been on a 20 year down spiral. Uh, the lawyer's not thinking much of it. Neither is the, uh, the father. So the like, not, the father is not in, as in Lawrence, but the the priest father dude. So, which also speaking of Anna, we also get the situation with her wife. Was it Layla? She's very, as Teddy kind of puts it, has her peculiarities, and it seems like she's a little because the way Teddy referred to her as like a journalist with clickbaity stuff is kind of how like a clickbait journalist. The way she makes, they make it sound like, because it seems like she's like paranoid, like she's checking all the stuff for bugs and it's like for like listening devices, even to the point she doesn't even want to go out and they're like, say, hey, like, let's go to this party. Like my dad's going to announce me as the CEO and we can dance afterwards. Like, I promise you I'm working on this deal. Sure. But I want us to spend time together too. It just seems like their relationship is complicated. It seems like it's still freshened of wounds. Whatever went down in a helicopter whether it was like the helicopter crashed or maybe it was attacked or whatever. Because specifically, Anna was like, I don't, I told her to quit her job, but she didn't. So, so the fact is Teddy referred to her as a clickbait journalist makes me think like she made enemies with just like, I don't know if that was just like her being just derogatory of like to like denigrate her job because she wasn't that good of a journalist. Like she kind of spiraled up some like maybe she had good stuff but she also had some bs or whatever like because the fact that she used specifically the title 
like clickbait me it seemed like it was meant to delineate that she's not like a real true journalist I, I don't know what to make of that but it's whatever that incident was has kind of created some fear in her and she's kind of paranoid about people even when like Keith across the hallway because I thought that was interesting too that Trip was like oh this is your room yeah my sister's across the hall he's like oh fancy that and even Layla when she was leaving the room like you were following us Sydney and stuff like that he's like lady I don't know what you're talking about he did seem a little like I was like, no, nah, it seems like there might be some truth to that, which we find out more about that later. But in just even without the context of later on, in that moment, it did feel weird like he was coming up with stuff last second trying to appease her. That's the problem. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're wrong. Like, you know, doesn't mean they're not really after you, you know? That's that's the thing. Like, it's kind of like being paranoid is like being a, cl a wrong clock. That cl wrong clock is right twice a day, you know, type of situation. So... She was kind of feeling paranoid, and so she didn't go to the um, the thing like she wanted to. So it just seems like that relationship's got its complications, and it's just like, and it's not blaming her wife. It's just a complicated thing to deal with. And once again, we just don't know enough of the circumstances of what exactly happened. Was she attacked? Like, is she she worried about being tracked and bugged? I'm like, I'd assume. Like, maybe she pissed off some very powerful people with her work. That seems like that's all insinuated. But we just, like I said, we just don't know the nitty-gritty details of it all. But anyway, uh, an, an interesting development is Imogen confronts Rufus at the party. And Rufus didn't recognize her. I was like, did he really not recognize her? Part of me had wondered, like, well, what if we find out Rufus isn't who he used to be? That maybe his mind isn't as keen as it used to be. Should also point out, it's kind of wild having Mandy uh, Patinkin play this role. Obviously, the thing best known for. It's weird to say this, Criminal Minds, even though he's only in, like, one season of Criminal Minds. I know, like, probably more recently when you get, like, Homeland. I've, I've not seen, I've seen bits and pieces of the show because I've been around other people who've watched it. But I know that's the thing it's kind of mainly done more recently. I'm um, not saying that's the only thing he's done, but, like, that's the biggest thing I know recently. But it's just, like, right, Criminal Minds being, like, the uh, police procedural kind of crime drama murder mystery of it all for him to be in a murder mystery now. Maybe he's probably done others as well, but it's just, that's just funny to me, too, because it's, like, right, like, his character of Gideon was, like, you know, it was, the whole premise behind Criminal Minds is being able to get inside the mind of the killer and understand their psychopathy and understanding what makes them tick and what makes them choose their victims, you know, the psychological angles of, you know, an investigation. So, like I said, it's just kind of interesting to see him in a similar light in the more crime drama reign because I know Homeland was more like the national scale of like, hey, let's, you know, um, the political situation and kind of, terrorist stuff it was kind of like i think it was cia related i think that i think that's what that show was based around like the cia and stuff like that i believe that's what claire dane's character was a cia agent i, I could be mistaken either way like i said i don't know enough about the show but uh, i'm going into this massive tangent i want to shift away from that and go back to what i was saying but either way him not recognizing her first made me think like could it be that maybe he's lost a step or two and maybe his mind isn't what it was. I was wondering if that had anything to do with why he abandoned her case, uh, her mom's case and stuff. Like It made me wonder if there was something to that. But then later on, he's like, no, I, I knew who you were. Well, he's like, the name came back to me, which now, knowing what we know at the end of the episode, it seems like that was all bullshit. I guess he didn't want people to really know. Like they wanted, he, wanted, he wants to appear a certain way. He wants to appear like, oh, I failed. I'm this drunkard. I'm nobody. Because... People don't expect it. It's like, oh, he was the greatest detective. No one's going to be paying attention to you if you seem like a loser. And it's just like, it seems like he was playing that role. So it just seemed like, it, it, like I said, I'm, I was like thinking like, could he have really forgotten who she was? But it's like, no, it seemed like it was all on act. But either way, um, when the murder does ultimately happen, um, Imogen goes to try and release, uh, delete the footage because she remembers seeing the camera. She looked at it directly, but she didn't think much of it. Who cares? Well, now it's like, cool, you're the number one suspect. But when she goes to take care of the footage, she's like, huh, it's deleted. Interesting. And it's like the seven minutes that she was in that room is gone. And you're like, that's what benefits you. Because it's like, you don't have to worry about the footage. You don't have to delete it. But it's like, why was it deleted? Because whoever it was you know, had to protect themselves and in turn protected you, but they've also offered you up as the number one suspect because 
Rufus ends up actually having the footage, and if Interpol gets involved, which they've got like a, they've got like a small window before Interpol actually gets aboard the uh, ship and you know starts investigating themselves. Until then, it's Rufus's investigation, and because of that, they got a small time window before. Because if Interpol gets a hold of this, they're not going to look for any other suspects. As Rufus kind of puts it, the whole Arkham's Razor of it all, like oh, the simplest answer is most likely correct. He's like, that's kind of bullshit. And even then, I'll, I always, I've used that example before, but I always, always make sure to also put in there, that's not really what Arkham's Razor is. That's the simplified version that a lot of people use, myself included. There's, there's a little bit more to the Arkham's Razor, but it always gets, like, reduced to just, oh, the simplest solution is most likely the answer. I don't think that's all that, it might, I don't know if that's, like, a, a completely wrong definition or more of it's, like, a, it's an oversimplification of Arkham's Razor. But I, I just thought, from an investigator standpoint, for him to be like, yeah, the simplest answer is always the uh, the, the answer. But it's like, no, nah, that's that's bullshit. You know, it's, I just thought that was kind of interesting. So, but uh, Rufus decides that he's going to bring Imogen along as his assistant. So I love them talking to Teddy and trying to talk to the housekeeper after they went to investigate keith and it's like okay so obviously housekeeping was in here because there's disinfectant in the air so who knows what they might have seen or taken out of the room while they were cleaning up because they were clean like the house uh, housekeeper saw like was cleaning up a little bit before she ended up before she ended up uh seeing and noticing keith's body at the last second you also don't know how much time passed before uh, who was it? It was Teddy and Sunil who went to the room. Who knows how much time passed between the housekeeper being in that room and them being in that room or how much time passed before they left that room. Like who knows what could have been tampered with in that time frame. I should also go back to the security footage really quickly too, because when Jules and, um, Imogen were hooking up. They made sure to show you, like, all right, we saw the lawyer. He was making some deal that looked like that was someone maybe from the Chun family. We saw the priest or pastor or whatever. We saw him in what looked like kind of a chapel with someone. I don't know if that's like a fling thing going on. I don't, you don't think that was the wife, do you? Miss um, Collier. I don't, because it looked like someone that had blondish hair and it kind of seemed shortish, but it didn't seem like quite like her hair shape. So, but it seemed like he was getting close to somebody, like, I think we even saw, like, after the footage of Imogen, like, once we were looking at the deleted footage, we see someone kind of nearby, almost like drunkenly walking by. That might just be some passenger on board, but who knows. I'm probably missing other details, which obviously details are what matters the most. Um, so who knows what other little things I could have missed that will ultimately end up being very important. But I'm sure the show is going to do a good job of circling back to being like, oh, here's a detail you might have missed or overlooked that will be significant, or at least it'll lead to another clue. As uh, Imogen kind of puts it, coincidences aren't just coincidences. She's kind of saying, like, basically they're um, an untapped clue or something like that. It's easy to brush coincidences off as just coincidences, but they're just the fact that something happens can't just be a coincidence. It's most likely a clue you just haven't unraveled yet, or it's a clue you haven't that hasn't revealed itself to what its significant significance is in the grander scheme of things. But either way, uh, circling back, uh, they they talk to Teddy and the housekeeper, and I love that like the the aunt's talking for a while, and then Teddy's like, "Yeah, she didn't see anything." I was like, "That sounded like a lot more than I didn't see anything," but it's because um, Rufus wasn't too worried about it. He's like, "No, she's just trying to protect her aunt," and Teddy did not like that because it's like you understood everything, and even uh, Imogen's like. You speak Cantonese? He's like, I dabble a little bit. And Teddy's like, dabble elsewhere. But it's like, right, the um, the aunt didn't see anything. And he's like, whatever secret Teddy is keeping doesn't necessarily mean it's related to this. It might be something else unrelated. That, like, I mean, Teddy's probably keeping secrets about some of the stuff in the investigation, but it could also just be, like, stuff related to her family on why, like, she doesn't want them in the middle of this. Like, 
maybe they stole something, maybe they've been skimming some stuff off the top, which they wouldn't be the only ones because we found out from Rufus that it's like, yeah, like how much will Imogen and her family really protect you when it comes down to you them finding out that you've been skimming a little bit off the family tree? Because I mean, she's got she's had sticky fingers ever since she was a little kid. Um image and we've seen we've seen that situation I'm like yeah she she's got quite the sticky fingers i don't think it's, it's not like a klepto thing it's just you know she enjoys it she's uh, you know for whatever reason once again i don't know if that's her way of once again sticking it back to the rich by like stealing from them in some shape or form it's like right you're filthy rich it's not like you want to miss much not unless like i brought up earlier there's more to the Lawrence's family that they might not be in the best situation and some of that stuff you might have been skimming off the top could have been money they've borrowed from someone else it could be a laundering situation and you dabbled with some dirty money you know and I'm sure the argument could be made it's rich people's money of course it's dirty I think an argument could be made I'm not one of those people that's just like fuck all rich people but I'm not gonna be like oh like poor rich people I'm just gonna be like I'm very neutral towards rich people I know people have Typically, very, very negative opinions of rich people. I'm Like I said, I'm kind of indifferent, but that's just me. I don't want you to take that as like, oh, you should feel the same way. You hate rich people. That's your prerogative. Yeah. So I just had to look this up because it, it, it was in my mind because I was looking at the cast again. And I kept wondering why uh, Winnie, which is uh, Teddy's sister, I was like, why does she look so familiar to me? It's uh, The actress's name is Annie Q. Regal. The reason why I recognize her is she's from Kung Fu. She was Juliet Tan. I was like, dude, because it's been a hot minute since I saw Kung Fu, so I would have. But I was like wondering why she looked so familiar. But that's definitely the thing I knew her from. I was like, oh man, um, that's wild. If you've seen Kung Fu, you know where, where that storyline goes. So that's that's pretty wild. But I was like, I didn't, I it didn't even correlate in my head. I didn't like even recognize. Because to be fair, that was like a season. Yeah, that was season two yeah so it was like even longer ago because yeah because I, I was looking at it, i was like right it says 2022 it was like yeah that was a, that was from season two but either way tangents and all that side so once again i just i just wanted to add that in there because i was like oh yeah like i kept it kept nagging me why i recognize her i'm glad i looked that up but some other interesting um, moments we had was like imogen obviously her and Rufus make a really good team. And so I love when she was hiding in cart. She's like, okay, so uh, they were dropping the cart off here, here, and here. This is what happened. Most likely the killer was hiding in this when I was in the room. So they saw me. And now that potentially puts me in danger even more so as this goes on. Or maybe I already was. But if the, because even Rufus made a point of, well, maybe they were hidden in the cart. Maybe they weren't. But she's the one that kind of leaned into, they definitely did this. Uh, they most def they definitely hid in the cart. But when it's all said and done, like, you know, she's like, all right, we should go back to security cameras. And then she sp stopped. It's like, you already looked at the sec security camera footage, so you would have already known about the cart. So why would you have me go through all this? He's like, yeah, because I wanted you to figure it out on your own because it, it feels much more exciting when you're able to kind of discover it on your own. But it seems like he's training Imogen up. It almost feels like this, this is where my theory was immediately. I'm like, is... Is Rufus going to die in this show? I actually halfway expected, even though he was meeting up with everyone at the end of the first episode, I'm like, especially because Rufus is like, I'm still missing the final piece to the puzzle. But part of me wonders, I was like, it's Rufus. I'm getting to this late. So there's already episodes two and three out. I have not seen episode two and three yet. I want to kind of preface that when I say this, but is Rufus going to die like in the next episode or something? Because part of me wonders, could it be that Rufus is because maybe his mind isn't what it was and he sees that like from a very young age uh Imogen shown that she's very capable and she's very smart she's able to kind of see things in ways people don't and so Rufus has always kind of acknowledged her even at such a young age I think he wants to like increase that detective side of her thing I, I think he wants that to be her mark on the world that she leaves on this world is by being becoming the new greatest detective. It feels like he's setting her up in a protege type of way. Like he, he wants her to be, I mean, I don't know enough. I'm only basing this on elementary. I don't know if, and I haven't seen Sherlock in a while and I never saw all of Sherlock either. So I, I don't know enough Sherlock Holmes lore in general, but at least in elementary, 
Sherlock was setting up Watson to be um, a great investigator, right? So kind of like his, you know, he was training her up. To, I don't, not necessarily replace him, but also to have a peer investigator. So I don't, it definitely feels like he might be like passing his mantle onto her, which he doesn't, I mean, I guess the mantle of a great, the world's greatest detective he's kind of passing on to her because i think for him it's like not only are you good you can be greater and even better than me you know you've always had this gift even at such a young age even her mom referred to it as a gift that gift alone is worth more than any toy because she had stolen a toy of anna's um at such a young age because she had that perspective of yeah anna didn't even realize there's like a secret compartment to it it's like hey i took this thing she's not really going to notice because she's rich but also like she's not going to appreciate because she doesn't see the secrets that are there but it's like right but you don't need it still so but that returning that is what saved her life because if she didn't um her, she would have died in the car and even during that flashback when she was remembering everything she you know i i like when they do this in storytelling like this when like the person who's like questioning the person like you know usually an investigator you see them kind of walking through the past events with the character so like he's there with a young imogen uh with her her mom in that car and everything and he's there to hold her after the car explodes but because he really was holding her in real life i just thought that was I, I like I like from a cinematic standpoint of like handling murder mysteries like that like like a great example I, I the, one of the first instances I remember seeing that was like Willem Dafoe in the Boondock Saints when like he's recreating the scene and he's there in the middle of everything going down I I love stuff like that. God, I, I want to rewatch those movies. I know people didn't like the sick one as much, but I really, really like the sick one. I've not seen those movies in a very, very long time. When I, because I, my mom had those on DVDs, I did not realize those movies were as like old as they are. I want to say the first ones from like, ain't it from like ninety nine, and the second ones were like earlier two thousands. Like, like I think there was like a couple years in between the first and second one, but either way, what I thought was kind of interesting, if you notice, there's a truck or something right in front of the car before it explodes. So I wonder if there's any significance to that maybe maybe not i don't know if it was a truck but there's some kind of vehicle that was like driving a little bit just as the car was exploding so i i don't know what to make of that but obviously this all kind of correlates and relates because imogen's questioning rufus about why he quit her father her mother's case and he was like it's a lot more complicated because she's her from perspective is like hey you got all that money and then you just up and bailed after they stopped paying you. And he's like, no, that's what you think. It's a lot more complicated than that. Because he might have stumbled across the truth. And he was kind of forced off the case. Who knows. But he kind of quit. And he kind of like quickly like brushed Imogen aside. He's like, I shouldn't have made that promise to you. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to let this case go. He's kind of making it seem like present day. Like he never let it go. Which we find out he never did. As Imogen kind of pieces it together. Because it turns out she's been reading his books because maybe on some level, Imogen's never let the case go either. Well, not obviously, it's her mom's case. So she's probably been taking a lot of, she's probably learned secondhand uh, from, more like thirdhand from Rufus. Eh, not secondhand's more more appropriate because she's been reading his book and she tried to make it seem like, oh, I've skimmed it. It's like, no, she's got little stickers for like specific pages. She's got stuff highlighted because she wants to apply a lot of that to try and figure out who murdered her mom. She hasn't let it go and she's probably been working on it on her own, doing the best that she can in these past 18 years and maybe that's why she keeps the relationship with the Collier family because maybe she has her suspicions or at least that their money and resources could and connections could end up proving helpful but it hasn't given any leeway in this past 18 years for all we know we have no idea all that's going down these 18 years what she stumbled across what she's known what she's figured out same thing on Rufus's part because ultimately Imogen remembers that day and as Rufus was getting in the car to drive away she notices Keith in the seat and she's like right you always work everything with an assistant like he he was part she was partially his assistant during that investigation but now it's like no your real assistant was Keith it's like so why was Keith on the boat she's like why were we on this boat together and then Rufus turns to her it's like you know why I was like 
Oh my God. This all, all of this relates to her mom's murder. He had never let the case go. He's been working it this entire time, making people, like I said before, seem like he was beaten down, like he was some drunk, like he lost a step. He was a hack because people aren't expecting anything. So they think he's lost his way. It makes it easier for him to sneak around and continue his investigation, you know? Maybe there was some truth to it. Maybe he was beaten down to some extent, but maybe after a while he picked himself back up. But I feel like the whole, from the moment he quote unquote quit her mom's case to being on his boat right now, that's why he's here because gathering all the people that are suspects, plus he also knew Imogen was going to be on this boat. That's why I was like, he was pretending like to not to know her just to kind of keep his, his, um, his standing as, oh, I'm the drunk, I've fallen off, I've not the uh, great detective I once was, so people underestimate him, um, so no one really knows what he was planning, and I think Imogen finally pieced it together at the end of the episode, but now it makes sense why Keith was murdered. It also adds some interesting layers to the whole, like I said, I think the, I think Anna's wife's name is Layla, but she was like, oh, you you followed us in Sydney and stuff like that because he was keeping an eye on them. So he like she probably, yes, she might be paranoid, but she was probably right because he probably was following them because, he, you know, trying to keep tabs on the family. Because uh, she was like, she even told Anna, Keith uh, Davisky or whatever his last name is, doesn't exist. And it seems like he didn't. Like I said, at the time when he was talking to her, even without the end context, it's like, it felt a little weird like she was probably right about him, but we now have the context of he was Rufus's assistant, so them both being on this ship, him trying to get in good with the Collier family, making a deal with Trip, he was pushing back on that trip, like, uh, he was probably, like, hesitant about the deal he's making with Trip, and Trip's like, hey, you have until midnight, yada, yada, so on and so forth. So it makes you go like, okay, so Keith was playing that slow because he didn't really have the money. He's not really who he claimed to be, so he couldn't really do what Trip needed him to, but Trip was pushing him in a corner. So it presents two motives of why people would want Keith dead. One, Keith was not who he claimed to be, so that gives people like Trip motive enough to want him dead. It's like, oh, I, I, I sunk a lot into this. You were kind of my my cash cow opportunity um, to spring back up and for everything to kind of work in my favor. But more likely is people found out who he really was. He really works for Rufus and someone stumbled across that fact and like, oh, we got to kill him. Who knows what he's playing at? Because once again, it is interesting that the mom out of anyone specifically said Rufus was hired by the Chuns just to mess with us, but the lawyer was like, well, then don't let it get to you. So it is interesting that she would take it that way. Everyone else kind of did to some extent, but once again, that family's got their complicated history and relationship with Rufus. So, But at the end of the episode, we have Rufus gathering everyone up, and Imogen's there like, oh, I want to go first as he wants to talk to everybody. Once again, I could be completely wrong. Like, Rufus might be in the entire show. Maybe it won't be till near the end of the show that he dies. But it just, I get the feeling like he's going to die and it's going to be up to Imogen to solve all of this. He probably wants it to be Imogen who figures it all out because, for, for one, he needs to be the one to solve it because he owes it to Imogen for making her feel like she was alone these past 18 years and not solving her mom's murder. But now he might be able to. There's that. But also, she will be a key component in both Keith's murder, but also her mom's murder. So, not unless we find, I, I doubt it, but I also just feel like the timing was interesting. The car just happens to explode when Imogen was out of the car. So, part of me is like, you don't think her mom faked her death? It's like, well, how do you really fake something like that? I mean, the trauma of it all could make it so that you think you saw what you saw, but what did Rufus say kind of about details? Like, the human memory isn't that great. You kind of, even she was trying to remember stuff in Keith's room but kind of got some of the details wrong and had to go back and be like no it was this it was this so we'll see maybe maybe her mom faked her death I doubt it but like I said only the first episode there's still so much to go uh because I think this is 10 episodes uh which is so interesting because the trip itself is supposed to be like 10 days to be fair like th that flashback of when they got on the boat was like uh, two or three days ago so I was about to say, not less every episode is going to be a day, but it's not going to work out like that timeline-wise. But either way, I'm excited to see where episode two and three ultimately end up taking us going forward with this. But uh, yeah, that's all I really wanted to talk about. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and 
Goodbye.